as I was saying that, something else flashed into my mind and it went right up this year. <laughs> uh, but um, regardless, there will be a fire practice immediately following church. Um, fire members <coughs> are looking, we're going to try to sing next Sunday, but well, we'll see. You've been through the number at least twice. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. You've just done such a marvelous job that I, I have no doubt in my mind that we won't sing next Sunday. Um, Pat's waving at me. Potluck. Oh, potluck. That's, thank you. That, that's what went right out there. Uh, next Sunday, is, we're having a Christmas potluck. Uh, we did not have one last year, obviously, because of COVID. Now, there will be no Santa, no exchanging of Santa gifts to any children that might come. Uh, but they do have a sign-up list on the uh, offering table um, asking if you kind of have in your mind what you think you would like to bring, an appetizer, a side dish, a main dish, dessert, whatever. Uh, if you know, pick one, sign up. Meat will be provided by the uh, um, social committee. I assume their favorite is fried chicken, so I'm guessing that's what it's going to be, but I don't know. Could be ham. Maybe if you're ham or chicken, are you sufficiently hungry yet? <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, be sure and plan on staying for that. It will be right after uh, church next Sunday. Uh, and we always have a, have a good time and give you a nice way to socialize with uh, particularly all the new people that we uh, took in last Sunday. So, okay. Any other announcements anyone would like to? No hands? All righty. Well, let us go ahead then with our Advent prelude that we have with Mary and um, uh, Karen this morning uh, as we prepare our hearts for the service.
came with the lighting of the first candle in the Advent wreath and an Advent prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. You call all nations to walk in your light and to seek your ways of justice and peace. When the night is past and the dawn of your coming is near, bless us as we light the first candle of this wreath. Rouse us from sleep that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes and welcome him into our hearts and homes, for he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Amen. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may fly to your will. And walk in your ways to the glory of the Holy Name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing.
and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. For the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, alert us to the threatening dangers of our sins and redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will save, live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. We will read the songs responsible. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me into your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I have trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your passion and love, for they are from the blessing. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You are gracious and upright, O Lord. And therefore you teach the sinners in your way. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All your paths, O Lord, are steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant and your testimony. The second reading is from Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in loneliness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. the moon and the stars and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves people will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world 
for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout their leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be on your guard, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place, and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, yes, it is good to be back here with this congregation. Again, of course, the congregation has changed, and I have changed a little bit as well. <laughs> I used to have some hair, and I used to have children with me. I don't know if it was three or four at that time. <laughs> But they now have their own children as well. So, the question of this time, of this month, that you will hear, or perhaps you will pose to one another in the days and weeks ahead is, are you ready? And of course we mean by that, do you have all your presents purchased? Have you gone to the store and purchased all the groceries you need to do? Have you baked? Have you decorated? There's a whole list of things that you have to do between now and December 25th. And so that question, are you ready, will be sometimes a welcomed question that you're glad to hear. Sometimes you will dread that question because you know you have a whole lot left to do. And sometimes you just ignore the question. Because, well, for any number of reasons, you're not interested in responding to that question just now. But I want to ask that same question today with a different slant, a different context that comes from the gospel text we had, which focuses on the return of Christ. Are you ready? And that question is a whole lot more important than deciding what you have left to do before December 25th. Are you ready for the return of Christ? Now, some people, when they hear that question, they're excited. They're joyful. And yes, I am. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Others to say, uh, no, I'm not ready. And they actually dread the question because they do not want to face the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords face to face. They're not ready. And other people ignore the question totally because they don't think it's real. They don't think that there is a Lord of Lords and King of Kings that's coming back is with great power and glory to judge all. But just think about it. Madison Avenue and the advertising departments of every store and chain and every business entreprise in these days coming up before December 25th, they're, they're pulling out all the stops, right? We don't get those big thick catalogs in the mail anymore from Sears and, and others, but we do get a few thin catalogs and we do get lots of emails, we do get lots of electronic communication, television ads trying to get us to spend more money. Well, what if Madison Avenue got a hold of thinking, you know what? This end times thing is real. Let's use that 
for marketing purposes. So what would the cover of Sports Illustrated show if you were looking at the end times? Game over, <laughs> right? And ladies home is yours home. An article would be, lose 10 pounds by judgment day with our new Armageddon diet. <laughs> or Money Magazine, 10 ways to profit from the apocalypse. <laughs> CNN, world ends, women and children most affected. <laughs> All right, that's not gonna happen. That's not going to happen, but it's nice to think and play with that a bit. So we're looking at the end times today, and that's part of Advent, right? The first Sunday of Advent usually looks at what's coming with the second coming. Now, second, third, and fourth Sundays of Advent, the, the theme shifts, and we're looking more at Christ's first coming as well. But today we're looking at the second coming. And as you well know, there are 101 different perspectives on the end times. We in the Christian church across many different denominations and even within the same denomination, within the same congregation, we have different opinions as to what's going to happen first, second, third, or what's going to happen at all. There's lots of different ideas about how we should interpret the biblical passages about the last days. When will the rapture happen? Pre-tribulation, post-tribulation? The rapture will happen, in case you're wondering, this great catching up of the believers that are alive at that time, catching them up in the air to be with the Lord forever. The question is, when will it happen? And will life on earth continue after the rapture? Or will that be the end of everything in one fell swoop? Will believers go through the great tribulation, with that great time of persecution and suffering for the church? Or will they be saved from that and removed before it happens? Will Christ reign on earth for a thousand years, literally? Or will that be a figurative interpretation of that passage in Revelation? Or will all of this happen together in one grand climactic day that we call the Day of the Lord? That is not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about what we have different from one another of our perspective of the end times. What I'm going to talk about is what the Bible teaches that all of us can hold fast to, no matter what we believe about the chronology of the end times, there are some things that we all, all Bible-believing Christians, believe about the end times. The first thing that we all believe is that Jesus is coming back. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Yeah, Jesus is coming back. Now, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, we don't know how it's going to happen, we don't know exactly the chronology of everything leading up to that, but we do believe that Jesus is coming back. Now, he said that he came in humble means the first time. In Bethlehem, a small little no-account town outside of the big city of Jerusalem, little Bethlehem, off to the side. Jesus was born in a stable, laid in a manger, and only a few people were really honoring his coming. Yes, it had been predicted in the scriptures for centuries ahead of time, and we even had Bethlehem named in Micah, but only the shepherds came, only the magi came, 
Of course, the Magi stopped in and saw the king, and he consulted with all the scribes and Pharisees and the chief priests, and they actually quoted from Micah. But they didn't go. They didn't go. They didn't worship him. They didn't honor him. They didn't believe it was real. So only a few shepherds who had a pretty spectacular announcement, but only they came. We only had a handful of people of all the nations on earth. Only a handful of people acknowledged that God came in human flesh. But the second coming, how will that be announced? Everyone on earth will see. He will come with great power and great glory and the whole world will be in awe at the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's real. It's happening. We all agree upon that. Second thing that we all agree upon. This world is temporary. But God's word is eternal. Verse 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. God's word is sure. The things of this world are temporary, but the things of God are eternal. If we place our trust in the temporary things of this world, we will be undone. We will be sadly disappointed when what we put our weight on gives way. Even good things in this life will not last through the day of the Lord. But in the end, God's word is eternal. The third thing, after the fact that Jesus is coming again, uh, the world is temporary, and God's word is eternal, the third thing is, we can do something about it. We're not part of the planning committee, but we are part of the welcoming committee for the return of Christ. Be ready. You can do something about your own heart, about your own anticipation of the coming of Jesus Christ again. Be ready. Verse 34, Be careful of your hearts, for your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, anxieties of life, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. We do not know the day or the hour of Jesus coming, but we do know that he is coming, and so we need to be ready every day. Every day. And how are we to get ready? Repent and believe in Jesus. As simple as that. Repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus. There will be signs, but there are many different kinds of signs that go on around the world all the time. I remember our, one of our first weeks in Cameroon when we were there in the 80s, there was a solar, a, a lunar eclipse one afternoon, right? The late afternoon, the full moon came up and there was a lunar eclipse. And those people, of course, were not educated in the science of the movement of the sun and the earth and the sun and the moon all lining up together so that there's a lunar eclipse. What did the believers do there? They gathered together and they And my first thought, as a Western educated person, scientific in my mind of what, what was happening in a lunar eclipse, was all these benighted people, they don't really know what's going on. And then I realized, oh my goodness, I think they do understand what's going on better than I do. What do they do? What do believers do when something happens they do not understand? They bow their knees, they repent of their sins, and they give their hearts to the Lord Jesus. 
They preached to me that day that this is what believers should do when things happen in life that are hard to understand. Are there things in our lives that are hard to understand? Why this happens? Why that happens? What do we do? Too often we just complain. We should take our tip from the Cameroonian believers that gathered that day in the face of a lunar eclipse and they bowed their heads, they repented of their sins, and they placed their trust in the Lord Jesus. There are so many times, I think it's almost every decade, there's somebody that begins to predict a specific day or an hour when Jesus is coming again. There, and some of them get great publicity, the media picks up on it, and they, they make a big deal about it. And then, of course, those that were <coughs> confident of the prediction are greatly disappointed. But Jesus himself and Peter and John and many others have said very clearly that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. You do not know the day nor the hour. No one knows when it will happen, but it will be sudden and it will be sure. Watch out for the weights, the things that are heavy. There's a word here in our text today that I think not many of us would be able to give a definition of unless we look it up in the dictionary like I did. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation. Just in your heart. Can you raise your hand? Can you give a definition for dissipation? Dissipation, according to the dictionary, I looked it up, means being scattered. Having your mind and your efforts and your, your investment scattered all around and you are not focused on the things that are most important. Be careful, Jesus says, so that your hearts are not weighed down by lots of different concerns which really amount to nothing instead of being focused on the main thing in life. So you don't be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and anxieties of life. Things that do not matter. There are some things that will happen this next month that do not matter. Some parts of our celebration do not matter. Some things are sort of marginal. They're good because they build relationships with people. But then there are the things that are very clearly important. And that is focusing upon the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God for the great miracle of God deciding to come in human flesh, bear the weight of our sin, and lead us to everlasting life. That is what matters. Are you ready? Not for December 25th. Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Have you repented of your sins? Have you invited Jesus to be Lord of your life and say, thank you God for giving me the faith through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are in my life and you are leading me? Yes. Shiver singing of that day when it comes. I pray that it's in my lifetime. But even if it's another thousand years away, we will see that day. Whether we're here standing upright or it's in our spirits after our, these bodies have passed away, we will see that day. And we will be part of that crowd that gathers around the throne of God. Every tongue, every tribe, every nation will bend the knee. And we will proclaim, Jesus is Lord. To the glory of God. I look forward to that day. Are you ready? If you're not, I pray that you will be. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the preparation time that you give us to repent of our sins and gather our hearts with you on those things that are most important.
come Holy Spirit, may everyone in this gathering today be brought up, caught up in you, in Jesus, to be ready for your great day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For centuries, the church has confessed its faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, not written by the Apostles, but written in response to what the Apostles preached. So when we gather and we pray and we pronounce these words together, it's not just we ourselves that are gathered together in this faith statement, but Christians from all generations. I invite you to stand. And together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for the people according to their needs. How precious is your love, dear Father, and how vast your mercy. You made solemn promises to Israel, and through them to the world. In Jesus, your promises find their eternal fulfillment. Prepare our hearts for these threefold coming among us. As the babe of Bethlehem, veiled in human flesh, as head of the church, veiled in word and sacrament, and as king of the universe, veiled only in robes of light and love, the glorious fulfillment of your ancient promises and our eternal heart's desire. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Fill your church with your Holy Spirit so it may instruct sinners in your way. Strengthen it in holiness. Give it boldness to proclaim your word that shall never pass away. Make it abound in love, especially when persecuted, so that its enemies do not exalt, but instead repent and believe in the good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Adorn this congregation with faith, love, mercy, generosity, and holiness. Turn our hearts and hands to adorn with these gifts all who are suffering. Unite us in faith toward you and fervent love for one another under the glorious and gentle rule of the Messiah. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember our call committee and give them faith, perseverance, patience, and love as they continue to work towards bringing a new pastor to Zion. As we continue to support our ministry in this community, give us each those same attributes. Knowing that you already selected our new pastor, please send him the Holy Spirit to guide him to a God-pleasing decision for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We plead on behalf of everyone who needs your merciful care and glorious deliverance. Gladden their hearts, hear them, heal their bodies, uphold their spirits with your Holy Spirit. Surround them with the love and care of all who hold them dear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, we entrust into your never failing care our beloved dead. Ease the sorrow and revive the spirits of those whose Grief runs deep. Gather us with all the redeemed into your eternal kingdom, where we shall rejoice in your goodness and righteousness forever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we take a moment to share the peace of the Lord with each other. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of a godly life. Enable us to receive Him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to His. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If the Apostles' Creed dates back centuries, this blessing we are about to receive dates back millennia, to the time of Moses and Aaron. And it says in the following verse, In this way, so you shall place my name upon my people. Receive the blessing, receive the name of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.